Uh, unit 4.16, constructing trigonometric functions to model a given situation. This is where the real life situations occur and we are going to use the functions that we've spent so much time studying to model and then pre make predictions about these real life situations. With, let's go ahead and finish up the Ferris wheel question that um, we were working on today in class. So go ahead and pause the video at this point and finish it out. Um, we already discussed A here, thinking about the fact that it makes one full rotation every 120 seconds. So that means it goes from maximum point to maximum point in 120 seconds. So my period would be 2 pi, or I'm sorry, my period should be 120 seconds. And I know I can compute that by doing 2 pi divided by pi over 60. And that's, of course, multiplying by 60 over pi which gives me 120. Okay? So this is a correct function um, for my model. And so now I want to start thinking about what is the highest the Ferris wheel gets, um, so on and so forth. So give this a try, and I'll talk briefly about it in just a few seconds. All right. So the highest the Ferris wheel ever gets um, is going to be 27 feet. And the lowest it ever gets is going to be, well, 15 minus 12, or 3 feet. And the way that I know that is, if I'm looking at my function here, this is the midline, right? And what am I going to be adding to 15? Well, I'm adding 12 times sine of pi over 60 times t. Well, what's the biggest value sine can ever have? That's 1, right? Sine of pi over 2. So the biggest that this part of my expression can ever be is 12 times 1, which would give me 12 plus 15, or 27. Similarly, the smallest that this value can ever be is when sine is at its lowest value, negative 1. And so negative 1 times 12 will be negative 12, plus 15 is 3 feet. Where is the car when the Ferris wheel begins? So what I want to think about is, okay, when time is 0, where is the car at? Um, and this shouldn't be too hard for us to figure out because where does sine start off? Where is its y-intercept? Well, sine always begins at the midline, and that should make sense, right? Sine of 0 would be 0, and 12 times 0 is 0, plus 15. So I would be 15 feet off the ground, above the ground. Okay, so what I want you to do is I'm going to leave you to parts C and D and I want you to um, give these a try and what I'd like you to do is uh, um, I'd like you in your comment to go ahead and simply put the phase shift that your function in part C will have so right now just go ahead and go through work on part C and as the first part of your comment I want you to put the phase shift that you got here okay I to give you a little hint, it might be worthwhile sketching a graph or um, you know, doing a few things. But give it your best shot and then put your phase shift um, in your comment. So now we want to talk about how is it that we're going to construct sinusoidal functions. So remember that a sinusoidal function has this general form. Every sinusoidal function has this general form. A uh, absolute value of A is the amplitude. Uh, the period is 2 pi over the absolute value of B. H is your phase shift, and K is your midline, right? Um, and it can either be a sine or a cosine function. And so we want to think about, in any situation, what are we going to need to know in order to create a sinusoidal function? So think about the general form, and just think about what are the things that I'm going to need to create this. So go ahead and start your own list. Pause the video right now and create a list and we'll talk. All right, so I bet a lot of you thought, okay, I need to figure out my amplitude, A value, I need to figure out my B value, my phase shift, my, my midline, all these different things. And that is definitely very important. I do wanna say that the first thing when I'm creating a function is actually happens before that. And the first thing that I need to figure out or what is going to be the independent variable and what's going to be the dependent variable. Okay. Right? In other words, what is the 
what is the x here, right? Maybe it's time, maybe it's distance. And what is the output, the dependent value? Maybe it's the height of something, maybe it's the cost of something, maybe it's the temperature. But that is the first step, okay? Then, only after I've done that, should I find the parameters, right? And the parameters are the A, B, H, and K values, okay? So step two will be to find the parameters. And those, of course, are A, B, H, and K, right? And we know what those represent, amplitude, um, you know, B is incorporated in the period, H is the phase shift, and K is the midline. And we still will need to decide, you know, is this going to be sine or cosine? So linked with determining my phase shift is whether I want to use sine or cosine. Right? So that's important to remember. And what we also want to do is, you know, think about, so also consider, um, you know, that your A value could be positive or negative, right? So thinking about sine, for example, sine always, unless there's a phase shift, begins at its midline and then increases. Well, if there was a negative out front, we'd still start at the midline, but instead of increasing, it would decrease, right? It would reflect. So some things to take into consideration. How do I find the parameters? Well, these are going to be based on the situation. Okay? So these are based on real life. And so this is why it's important that we understand how these influence our function, because the situation that we're going to get isn't going to say, hey, a, the A value is 10. It might tell you that the maximum um, value that it ever reaches is 100. Then you figure out the midline is 50, and so you know your A value would also be 50. Okay. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and try this out. Go ahead and pause the video at this point. Um, copy this all down, might take you a minute or so, and then uh, just go through A, B, C, D, E, and F, and this is a pretty guided step-by-step -step process, okay? Go ahead and give it your own try, and then pause the video only once you've given all of these an effort, and I'm just going to say a couple of brief things and tell you what um, you should make sure gets put in your comment. All right, the first piece of advice that I have is sometimes it can be hard to visualize this data. So it might be helpful for you to make a quick graph, right? So your x-axis, of course, is going to be the month, the months, and your y-axis will be the temperature. And you could just make a quick dot plot, I don't know what it looks like, maybe something like that, of the temperatures and the months. And that will help you sort of visualize what your function needs to look like. And that can help you a lot when you're thinking about answering these questions. Okay? So then in your comment, what I want you to do is I want you to actually write out the equation for the function that you found that fits this data. Then as a uh, last little um, aside, what I want you to do is in each comment, so either you're asking a question or you're answering a question, if you're asking a question, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to put at the end of your question, put a question mark and then put another question mark. If you're answering a question, I want you to use an exclamation point. Okay? So your question should have two question marks and if you are answering someone's question, put an exclamation point. All right? um, keep the uh, awesome questions coming and the good answers as well and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.